start you do you like to start yeah, uh, yeah think, of course uh if you maybe you can start with the first uh, your explain a bit about your path from mathematics to philosophy you started as a mathematician didn't you well yeah so when i went to um university as an undergraduate at anu in in canberra in australia in the early 70s i i i thought naively that I wanted to be an astronomer. Um, so I thought I should study pure and applied maths and, and physics, and I had to do four subjects in first year. So for some reason, I chose philosophy. Um, but then I went on to do well, my second year, I did pure maths and physics. I didn't enjoy the, the applied maths, which was, in my view, taught in a more boring way in, at ANU at the time. There was a very lively young um, pure maths department. I mean, most people were in their sort of early 30s. Um, uh, led by led by Hannah Neumann, who is a remarkable um, mathematician herself. Um, but and then in my second year, I was uh, I think I was a lazy student and didn't do enough work in the physics. Whereas in in, in, the, in the maths, it sort of came more easy to me. So I was doing better in maths than I was in physics, and thought, oh, I'll just I'll just do pure maths. Forget the astronomy. So then I had to make up some my degree in some other way. And because I'd done first year philosophy, I could do an extra couple of uh, philosophy subjects. And then I that was philosophy of science and logic. And at that point, I started to get hooked. And it still took me some time to make a transition. And there was this very fortunate factor of, of meeting a young, um, at that point, young Cambridge lecturer in philosophy who was visiting ANU in, in my final year. Uh, and he said to me, had you ever thought about doing philosophy instead of maths? And those sorts of things are very influential, of course, uh, at that age. And so, well, it still took me another couple of years and I went to Oxford to do maths first, but then ended up going to Cambridge to do a PhD with this person, Hugh Muller, who, who was later, later held the chair that, that, that I've now held. Um, and that's how I became a philosopher, but I, I, I never completely lost interest in the um in in maths and especially in the physics and so some of the issues that we're going to talk about tonight illustrate the way in which at least in some sense i've, I've managed to main con um, maintain contact with some of the issues that interested me back then so shall we start with with how do you like to start time or i i, I i'm in your i'm in your hands oh, okay um well, what I thought is that uh, many of the topics you discuss in, in your works on Arrow of Time and also the Boltzmann bomb, and uh, I, I, the most fundamental issue is time. And I think many of us here who are not philosophers or, mathemat or physicists will think of time of like a click, a, a ticking clock, which starts when you get born and stops when you get uh, a die and goes all in one direction. That's kind of the feeling we have now. So maybe you can talk a little bit about other aspects of time. Well, um, it, it's a good place to start. Um, and uh, one way to get into those issues is to think about ways in which time seems to be different from space. I mean, one of the familiar ideas in the 20th century coming especially from relativity theory is that well, in some sense time is just another dimension like space but on the other hand time seems obviously different from space um, and we can distinguish i think at least four ways in which that seems to be so one is that it seems to many of us that the present moment is special in a way that the you know the, the present point is is not special i mean here is different for me even for all of you and all of you have your own individual here's but we're all sharing the same now more or less give or take a few lags um and, and so it's easy for us to have the idea that that you know, the present moment is a, an objective feature of reality in a way in which the, the 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 present point in space is not that seems to be one difference another difference is um one you alluded to that the, the time seems to it seems to have a dynamic quality it seems to flow or pass in a way that doesn't seem true of space um, another or, or, or the remaining two are both related to the apparent directionality of time 
Um, I mean, we think that the, there's a big difference between the past and the future. And that the past seems to us to be fixed and immutable, but the future seems to us to be open. I mean, that's a huge difference. Um, and, and so, again, we have the question as to whether that's a, a feature of reality or whether in some sense it's a, it's a feature of our perception. And then the last one, uh, perhaps the one most closely related to your characterization at the beginning, is the sense that time has a fundamental direction to it in a way in which space doesn't. I mean, if we think of a, a spatial direction like a, a road running east <coughs> and west, we can distinguish the two directions, but from the universe's point of view, there's, there's no deep difference. Whereas in, in, in the case of time, we, we, we have this feeling that somehow there's a deep directionality to time. So all the, 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 those are four ways in which time seems to be different from space. But for all of them, you can ask the question as to whether that's really a difference out there in the world or whether in some sense it's a matter of our human perspective on time. Um, and, and that's a very deep question which isn't resolved by any means, either in philosophy or in physics. Um, and so in, in, in physics as in philosophy, you can find people on both sides on, on all of those questions. And it's also, it's helpful to put it in, in context as part of a bigger question, um, which um, in the history of philosophy goes back at least to the 17th century when, when, when philosophy and physics diverged. Um, but in, in the 17th century, people like Newton and his forebears, Galileo and so on, um, and, and the philosophers, well, philosopher scientists, people like Locke in, in Oxford, they were thinking very much about the question as to what's really there in reality and what, and, and what, what is put there from the human perception. Um, Galileo writes about that and says that taste and color and sound have their residence solely in the sensitive body as he says, meaning they, they, they just come from us. They're not out there in the world. And what was out there in the world was thought to be the kind of things that the new physics was talking about, mass and, and length and things. And I think these questions that we started with about time are very much of that same character, but they're not yet settled. And that's one of the fascinating things about the subject. They're still very much open for debate. So the, I mean, one of the amazing things which has have, has has only become really fully not fully but uh, like where I went into it more depth by preparing for the discussion with you is this link between the aspects of time which are studied and the origin of the universe via the second law of uh, uh, thermodynamics which is an issue which I think came up first around 19, uh, 1896 by Ludwig Boltzmann, who is my great grandfather. So you have yes, this yes. kind of connection there. And he was thinking about that also, of course, he didn't know about the re recent developments now about the origin of the universe, which were done by people like Hawkins and others, and which are very deep in your work as well. So. Uh, maybe you can ex yeah well i mean i I'd, I'd like i it, with no disrespect to your great grandfather i'd like to back up just a little bit okay. further into the into the 19th century mm -hmm. um so by the middle of the 19th century or well, the middle of the 19th century you had the, the the beginnings of the science of thermodynamics which was a, originally a very practical problem of how you get the most sure, work out of the how, given... to, how to optimize steam engines. Exactly, and get, and get work out of lumps of coal. Um, uh, the, in, in some ways, the beginning of the mess we find ourselves in now. Uh, but, um, but one of the things that, we, in looking at it at a higher level, one of the things which was sort of coming into view, although in one sense it had never been out of view, in one sense it was always obvious, was the fact that there are many processes in the world which, which have a directionality to them in the sense that they happen in one direction, but not in the other. Um, and, and, and lots of ordinary processes like eggs breaking and coffee, milk mixing into coffee and thing, things of this kind. They're, 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 they're normal in one direction, but highly abnormal in the other. Yeah, Feynman, I think he says that by, by taking a, looking at a movie, most movies, if you look at them backwards, you know something is wrong. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But then, and, and so the, 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 these, 
these these processes like that were being brought under the umbrella of, of thermodynamics and especially the second law which was characterizing all, all of them as processes in which entropy this new term that was introduced uh, was increasing and then thanks to the work of um well especially boltzmann but also building on um, maxwell for example um a little bit earlier in the 1870s um there was a, a, a new statistical treatment of this so so that you know that there seemed to be a statistical argument for why these processes had to go in one direction because that would that was just a matter of overwhelming probability like if you start with a, a deck of cards all neatly arranged in suits and then shuffle them they, they, they'll, they'll all get mixed up and and um perhaps boltzmann's greatest contribution was or one of them was was the sort of mathematics of that but as boltzmann came to see there was a puzzle in that because the statistical configuration i mean the statistical arguments he was using they didn't himself themselves have a direction of time um and so if you could use them to show that entropy had to go up towards the future why couldn't you use them to show that entropy had to go up towards go up towards the past too and that was the problem that was first pointed out by his colleague Lo Schmidt uh, in Vienna. I think he was his teacher. I think Lo Schmidt. I think he was. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I'm not quite clear about the dates. Um, but so partly through that route, and also partly through some discussions that took place uh, among um, British scientists in in the, in the 1890s, there was sort of crystallization of of this question. How did entropy ever get to be so low in the first place? Um, and Boltzmann considers that in one or two places in the 1890s. And in one place, he, he describes a suggestion that he attributes to his assistant. He says, my old assistant, assistant Dr. Schutz. As far as I know, nothing else is known about Dr. Schutz, except that there's this reference to him in, in Boltzmann. Um, and the suggestion is that, look, if the universe is infinite in time, then the sort of random processes that he's describing, the random shuffling processes, will just occasionally shuffle the world into this highly ordered system that we find it in now. Now, of course, that's incredibly unlikely. It'll take billions of years for it to happen. But, and this is one of Boltzmann's great insights, if, we, if observers like us can only exist in such reasons, then it's not at all surprising that we find ourselves in one. So this is a very early example of what's now called anthropic reasoning in cosmology. But then he also saw that, that this, was, this picture was completely symmetric because the, 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 the process by which the, the, the sort of order was established and the process by which it then dissipates again are, are quite symmetric. So these places in the entropy curve where there'd be a kind of dip uh, were symmetric. And, and Boltzmann pointed out that you know creatures living on one side would see the future going in one direction, mm -hmm. creatures living on the other side would. And, and then he says, you know, it's a consequence of this picture that it, in, in the universe at large, just as in space there's no up and down, so there's no objective past and future. So as far as I know, that's the first time in, in, in science where there's a really explicit rejection of the idea that the direction of time is uh, an objective feature of reality. Uh, and Boltzmann is saying that if this hypothesis was right, then it would be, um, you know, it would be like up and down. And of course, our, our ancestors presumably at one time thought of up and down as perfectly objective. But we now know that, that up for me here in Sydney is very different from up for you in Japan or, or in the UK. Um, so that's, um, that's how Boltzmann's involved in this question as to why entropy is um, is now so low. And then what happened after that, I mean, uh, particularly in the 1920s, where it was the, uh, the, along came Hubble and the model of the expanding universe. And another Trinity man, uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, linked these two things together he, he could see on the statistical side the need to have what he called anti-chance, something highly unlikely at the beginning. And he says something like the neatest thing to do is to sweep it all up in a heap at the beginning of time. Mm. So once you've got the idea that there's a beginning of time from cosmology, then putting the, all this low entropy there seems like a natural thing to do. 
Um, and then sort of decades later in the work of people like Roger Penrose and, and Stephen Hawking, uh, there were more sophisticated ways to try to derive that from cosmology. <laughs> Though I still think it's still not clear how it's done. And there, and there are some new proposals relatively recently by, by, um, by Penrose, uh, which, mm. which might provide a solution. Mm -hmm. Roger, Roger Penrose. He has a brother, yes. I think, who is also working in that field. Um, is that Oliver? Oliver? Oh, yes, 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 that's right. I yeah. saw preparing for a discussion with you, I found some of his works also. On yes, so there are some pieces, quite early pieces from the 60s, um, which are relevant mm -hmm. by Oliver Penrose. But I think one factor or one point also which belongs in this Einstein's work, work of uh, relativity, of course, which also tells us that the point, the moment in time, as you mentioned before, is not the same for uh, everybody, no? So exactly, like, exactly. Uh, so, a future and past might be different for you than for me if we move at different speeds, for example. Yes, exactly. So that, that, that was a major uh, move in physics, which chipped away at the idea that there, that there was this kind of common now. And another factor of Einstein is, is of course, relativity. And gravity, uh, gravitation, force of gravitation also plays a role here. Maybe you like to mention. Yes, well, um, um, I, I suppose you can connect. You can connect that to. Um, I, I mean, another of the aspects of the sort of the, the intuitive idea of time is we have the idea that time flows, um, but of course, one of the what, what, one of the consequences of relativity theory is, if that's true, it doesn't flow at the same rate for everybody. Mm. It flows in different rates in different places. Maybe uh, next uh, thing we could talk about is a bit more about entropy, because entropy is such a mysterious uh, uh, quantity, uh, how do you say, concept. No? And uh, uh, maybe every one of us here, I think, has heard about entropy, but everyone will understand something different. And today is actually the birthday, the 105, 105th birthday of Claude Shannon. And Claude Shannon, he looked at information content of communication channels. And he came up with a formula to work out how much information can through go through a particular information channel and that, that he worked at Bell Labs. So in those days, people were thinking about telegraphs and, and telephone yeah. wires and thing, how and encoding and encryption and noise on telegraph wires. And he came up with a formula and he went, I forgot who it was, Norbert Wiener, another mathematician. And yeah, and another person with a Trinity connection. Is that right? I didn't know. Yeah, he, he was he was at Trinity around about 1910 or so. An Wiener. Yeah, and he 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 writes somewhere about the 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 Trinity philosophers at the time. So there there was oh, okay. Russell and McTaggart yes. and, and G. E. Moore. And one oh. of the things that Norbert Wiener points out is that the three of them bear a very striking resemblance to the three characters. Uh, in the um, illust illustration in the original issue, issue of Alice in Wonderland, of, of the oh. three characters at the Mad Hatter's tea party. So Moore is, is the Mad Hatter, uh, and no, Moore is the March Hare, Russell is the Mad Hatter, oh. and, and McTaggart, who, who was, uh, wrote on time, very famous for his work on time, and was, was the Dormouse. Uh, and and the, you know this is a brilliant observation and fascinating because the the illustration had been published nearly fifty years before, but here they all were in, in Trinity College at the same time. <laughs> and Shannon asked, I think it was Norbert Wiener, I forgot exactly who, but he showed him his work and he said, "How should I call this quantity?" And uh, he answered to him and said, "Call it entropy," because the Boltzmann has done very similar work, came up with a very similar formula. And your advantage is that nobody understands entropy very well. So if you call it entropy, 
you always have an advantage in any discussion because it's so hard to understand. So why do you think uh, 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 entropy is so difficult to understand? Or I, 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 I think I think I'm not enough of a mathematician to answer that question. Oh, okay. But there's a, there's another way in which something like that line sometimes get used in the 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 discussions that that I've kind of, I've been talking about that I do know uh, something about. I mean, people say, look, we don't even understand what entropy is. I mean, how can you spend your time worrying about the, the second law, which says that entropy increases if you don't know what it is? And, and to that, I like to say that, well, we, 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 there's a sense in, in, in which we have these competing um, definitions of entropy, but we don't need any of them to understand what the puzzle is, the puzzle that, that as it were, became clear as a result of the work of people like Boltzmann. All we have to do is reflect on all these examples of ordinary physical processes which happen with one orientation in time, but not the other orientation. So we're back with things like breaking eggs and, and stirring coffee and, and explosions and all of these things. We don't need the term entropy in order to observe that there are all these ordinary processes which oh, happen yeah, yeah. with one orientation. And so then the puzzle as to why that's so, given that the underlying laws of physics are essentially time symmetric, the puzzle is on the table there without mentioning ent entropy at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what I, when people ask me about entropy, usually I say, you know, there are many faces to entropy, but one of them is the me measuring information, you know, which is really Shannon's argument. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. It measures information. Huh? And it goes by the logarithm. And actually, well, we can talk another time. So, okay, maybe the next point is, or the last point, because uh, we keep track of the time, would be to talk about your one of your most recent papers, or your most recent paper about Boltzmann's time bomb. Why do you say oh, it's uh, a time bomb? <laughs> it's not, it's not um, that's not a particularly recent paper. I mean, that's a paper from about 20 years ago. Really? Um, oh, yeah. Then, so um, then, may, it... maybe you found, maybe there's there's a copy of it on, on the internet somewhere, which has a, a more recent date. Oh, okay. okay. Um, um, but uh, I mean, uh, as I said to you in an email, it's a, it, it's one of my favorite titles. Um, yes, yes, yes. But, and, but the, the, the bomb that I mainly had in mind was the, 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 the point that I mentioned in the beginning, the suggestion that there's no objective direction of time. Oh, okay. Um, okay, okay. And, and I, I really think that in, in a sense, that was Boltzmann put, putting a bomb under our, 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 our traditional intuitive conception of, of time. how reality is in much the way that, much the way, same way that Copernicus put a bomb under our, our, our conception that we lived at the center of the universe. Uh, so maybe before we have a discussion with... Could, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could, could, could I bring one other thing into the yes. discussion here? Of course, of course. Um, which I, I want to bring in partly um, because um, it has Boltzmann's name on it. And, and so through you, I want to sort of honor Boltzmann by mentioning it. Um, uh, I mentioned his suggestion that, that we might um, just live in a kind of accidental fluctuation. Mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, the universe might, we might have benefited from this sort of random shuffling of the cards, which has got things in this neat, very neat order. Um, the, the problem with that idea is people came to realize, and again, I think the first person to appreciate this point was Eddington in the late 20s. Mm -hmm. if, you think of, if you think of how much, how much, let's put it like this, how much luck is required to get creatures like us, how much low entropy is to get creatures like us. It's a lot less than is required to get the history that, because we think we live in a world which has a, a traceable history going back billions of years when entropy was much lower. Mm -hmm. But if you're just doing this by random shuffling, mm -hmm. by far, the, and again, it's, it's a matter of logarithms and so on. So, so the numbers here are, are, are vast. By far, the cheapest way to do it is for there just to be a small fluctuation which as Eddington puts it in his characteristic way, is just big enough to produce a few theoretical physicists who can then make observations and think, oh, look, we live in this space. So, and, and, and these, these ideas of brains who just sort of fluctuate out of randomness, they're now called Boltzmann brains. 
um, because it, it's a consequence, although Boltzmann didn't see it himself, it's a consequence of that picture that most observers won't have the kind of histories they take themselves to have. They'll just be these, the, these um, beings who've sort of formed out of um, you know, a random soup in, 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 a, in a completely different way. Uh, and, and it turns out that, that the issue as to whether we are Boltzmann's brains or not is an important issue in some modern cosmological models, because in some cosmological models, there are vast periods of time in which by the process that Boltzmann was thinking of, these observers like this could be created. And of course, you know, if, if the models have certain features, then it looks like it's much more likely we're like that than, than being creatures who actually have the past that we think we do. Wow. And so there's this, this, this fascinating problem of skepticism arising from these kind of Boltzmann statistical con wow. considerations, which is still a problem in, for some models in, in modern cosmology. I'm not sure I understand that because if I think I've got a past, well, the past I think I've got nevertheless constitutes some sort of order. It might be just order in my mind, but it's still order, isn't it? Yes, but it's a lot less. Uh, just having the order in your mind requires a lot less order than having that same order produced by the kind of processes that you think produced it. Can I ask a stupid question? So is the past not there? Oh, um, well, let's see. Are we, are we still talking about the, the, this Boltzmann brain possibility? Yeah. So in, in the Boltzmann brain possibility, the past would be there all right. It, would just, it, it, it just wouldn't be what we think it is. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's not quite like this, but if, well, actually it is like this. So think, 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 of, think of what happens to uh, a sort of brain or, 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 or a body like ours, kind of alone in space, would soon decay in some way. That's the most likely thing in the future for an isolated brain or, or, or body like one of ours, even if it's having the kind of experiences we, we're having now by the time symmetry of, of the statistical arguments involved, that's true in reverse too. So the most likely way to get something like one of us is for it just to have happened accidentally by a process which is a reverse of that decay process. That's much more likely than what we actually think is the case where there were you know, billions of, of predecessors of us, human and, and non-human which sort of took advantage of a, of a much bigger entropy gradient from the distant past. And by, so, extension, so, by extension, at least from my point of view, you are merely a figment of my imagination. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so when Eddington said that we need a few theoretical physicists, he, he, he sort of understated the case, we just need one. <laughs> One of the frustrating things about all these figments of our imaginations is that they don't do what we want them to do. <laughs> and things happen that we didn't expect and we find ourselves in situations where we say, ah, <laughs> and I look Actually, at the, this, 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 this like reminds me of, a, of a, another story. He's presumably he has assembled during his life and they're visible to me and they're there as things for him and that kind of links him to the physical universe through which he has passed up to this point kind of situation. I mean, I'm sort of inter fascinated by this problem because I'm a historian. And earlier, no, last week, sorry, I did a lecture to um, first year postgrad students um, in, because although I'm a historian, I'm a historian of architecture and architecture in Japanese universities, uh, state universities anyway, ends up in engineering. So there are people in engineering and other aspects of science and they're all in the same massive kind of 
um, uh, 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 faculty, if you like, super faculty yeah. that they've created, and giving them a lecture about um, history and architecture. And my beginning actually is to say, okay, so what is history? Um, and I start by saying, we start really, everything starts with this big bang and that's the world of physics and we move on and the conditions of life created on our planet, that's the realm of chemistry. And then as life forms develop, we get life forms and they change into more and more complex things and that's um, biology and its genetic change. And finally, we get to human beings and where history comes into it is our communication abilities, which allow us to transmit uh, sp very specific things to each other, but also through written documents and so forth, communicate with people who aren't alive anymore. And all of this process is happening through time and time has a directionality which the other three dimensions clearly don't, for us anyway, we can't get off it. And through that, we're reading what's happening and I'm kind of busy trying to reconstruct it. So if it's all a figment of imagination, well, that's quite nice in some ways, and a bit depressing in others. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't think we need to take this Boltzmann brain problem too seriously at the moment, um, but, um, it would be good to have an answer to the question as to why entropy is low at, at the you know, 13 billion years ago, uh, which provide an alternative to, to, to the suggestion that it's just a matter of random luck, because if it's just a matter of, you know, random fluctuations, then we, then we do still have the Boltzmann brain problem. But it occurred to me, actually, uh, um, this is taking things in a slightly different direction, but but um, it occurred to me that there are physicists who do deny the reality of the past for, for other reasons. Um, and I was once at a, 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 a meeting at the, the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in, in Canada, in Waterloo in Canada. Um, and the speaker was a, a quite well-known quantum physicist called David Mermin. Um, who's oh, I learned solid state so physics from his books. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know about it. But I don't know about those books, but he also has some very nice popular pieces about the puzzles of quantum theory. Um, and his interpretation of, of, of sort of quantum theory is, is that it's it's telling us that um, no, there is really no past um, and, and no future. There's just a, a present moment. And what we say about the past is just really a convenient way of making sense of our observations in the present. And so I said, you know, in the discussion, I said, no, I, it's, it's, it's an interesting suggestion, but I think we can take it a bit further. It, I said, it seems to me that, that um, our descriptions of other people, or to make it more specific, my descriptions of you are just a convenient way of making sense of my observations. And so what I, what I was pointing out to him was this same line of, of thinking, which was leading him to deny the, the past, could perfectly lead any one of us to deny the reality of, of, of everybody else. So it's a very well-known slippery slope in, in, in philosophy. Did you um, but it, it, it's an interesting comment on uh, the state of contemporary physics that you can find you know, very smart people like that who are led to take what by ordinary standards, look look like quite extreme views, denying the reality of the past. In the light of of, of their sort of conundrums of, in this case, quantum theory. You know, there's this uh, talk which Boltzmann gave uh, at the end of the uh, the nineteenth century about Schopenhauer. You know, he's very very rude about Schopenhauer, and essentially, I mean, his message is that. What he's saying is really that, you know, physics is uh, creating, uh, needs creative building without logical contradictions, and uh, which gives us, you know, rules how to act in this world. And uh, he was kind of telling Schopenhauer off for philosophy going into this type of extreme directions. 
Uh, did you have you read this? I'm sure you've read this. Article. No, no, I, 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 I I'm embarrassed. I, I, I've never read that. I, I, I don't it, think I've ever, ever read any Schopenhauer either. Yeah, he's well. Boltzmann has, but severely criticizes him. Yes. You know, he says uh, he he sees no reason in doing that type of philosophy. You know, where he wants to. He was really bringing him back to reality and saying, "Look, you know, uh, we." need to do something where we can have impact on the world essentially he's saying yeah. uh, yes i mean you you find you can find that that same sort of tension between physics and philosophy well into the um 20th century even in the 21st century i mean so there, there are some of the famous examples in the 20th century concerning time uh, it's a sort of the de debate between Bergson and Einstein about time. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly many people, including many philosophers, feel that Bergson simply didn't understand what Einstein was on about. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you can also find cases, and, and, and Feynman qualifies here, of, uh, of physicists being rather rude about uh, philosophy. Uh, while in so, at least in some cases, um, making um, Sort of philosophical mistakes, mistakes in reasoning yeah, themselves, yeah. Um, and and so one one of the themes in in my book, Times Hour and Archimedes Point, was in effect pointing out some of some of these logical fallacies and some of the thinking both by physicists and philosophers mm -hmm. about some of these problems as to where the time asymmetry gets in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Boltzmann, he was both philosopher. He, he was saying about himself, he was saying that he is a German mathematician. That's how he was describing himself. Uh, German in the sense, I mean, of course, Austrian, but German in the sense of culture and language, because at that mm -hmm. time, Austria was a very big empire and uh, German part was, today's Austria is the German part of the big Austria. And so yeah, he yeah, saw himself yeah. as a German. So when he wrote this wonderful book uh, article about a German professor's trip to the El Dorado, where he was describing his travel to California. And he was describing himself as a German mathematician visiting California. But he was, uh, I mean, he was professor of philosophy also. And uh, so he was uh, kind of uh, how say, oscillating between mathematician and uh, physics and philosopher later in life. No? Earlier, not early. Uh, he wasn't a philosopher earlier in life. But from maybe 19, maybe 1895 or onwards or so, he started mm -hmm. to think more about philosophical issues. And he, he gave this lecture course on philosophy as well. Where I, I you know, I discovered this, they, these lecture notes were thought to be lost. And uh, when my great grand, uh, when my grandmother died, I inherited his writings. So I went, took a break from my PhDs days uh, in Cambridge and went for two weeks to Vienna and cataloged it, looked to what is there and discovered this, uh, lectures on philosophy of Boltzmann, which were thought to have been lost. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful contribution to intellectual history right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very funny because I was a PhD student and they invited me to give a talk in Vienna at the, one of the conferences on Boltzmann. And, you know, as a PhD student in Cambridge, I was always used to have poster sessions in conferences, you know, which nobody looked at very much really. And in Vienna at this Boltzmann conference, I had the primary talk right after the Minister of Education of Austria. <laughs> <laughs> so... But uh, that is quite important, and uh, it's interesting how. You... I wonder if I could ask something about Trinity philosophers, um, in the sense that I've just been reading the biography of Ramsey. Oh yes, it's a wonderful book, was... isn't it? Sorry. It's a wonderful book, Cheryl. It's great. Cheryl it has a, yeah. a sort of rumbustious character to it. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a lot of life and action, quite a bit of sex actually as well. In the whole thing, um, and I think that the author had this brilliant idea of having these guest 
appearances by particular people who explain in little um, little boxes uh, aspects of Ramsey's mathematics and and or philosophy. But of course, he was a Trinity undergraduate. Yes, uh, and then and then and then Keynes Keynes stole him from under the nose of Trinity and got him yes. a fellowship in Kings. Yeah, uh, and they had, had, to, had to change the rules uh, because Kings had never appointed one somebody who wasn't one of their own to a yeah, fellowship. Absolutely. And I don't think he even had an MA by the time he got his fellowship no. at Kings. Um, but the, the thing I wanted to ask was, of course, uh, Ramsey's most famous work, I suppose, well, it's difficult to say because there are so many extraordinary things that he did in such a short life. Um, but is the foundations of choice under uncertainty. Yes. And uh, that whole, you know, the, the famous paper on probability and, and yes. choice. Yes. Yes. Um, and I was just, just puzzling away through the discussion of time um, to also reflect on time and choices, because one sometimes argues that some choices are irreversible and some choices are reversible. And so the concept of time and choice as an act, as an act, as opposed to something that's random, as, a, as an act, seems to me to impinge on this notion of reversibility or non-reversibility. Yes, and in fact, I'm really I, I, stepping I, I, outside my territory and saying talking nonsense, or this is no. Me. But I, I, I'm really delighted that you you brought Ramsey into this discussion um, because um, but by, 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 by just tweaking um, your, your question a little bit, I can relate it to, um, to some of the things okay. we've already been talking about. Yeah, that's very but, 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 but also, yeah. also, also, um, also I get to mention uh, what, you know, from my personal point of view is, is the, the, the most interesting part of, of Ramsey. Um, and, and this is in a, a, one of the little posthumously published pieces called General Propositions and Causality. Um, and one of the questions that, that Ramsey um, comes to in, in, in that piece, uh, I mean, he starts off talking about what distinguishes sort of law-like generalizations, like all men are mortal, from, um, from other kinds of statements. Um, but leaving that aside, he then gets on to causal laws and he comes to the question as to the difference between the past and the future. The thing I mentioned at the beginning, our sense that the past is fixed and the future is open. Uh, and he says, well, where, did, where does that come from? And he immediately shifts in a very characteristic way to thinking about the psychological aspect of the problem. So he says, let, let, let's think about our causal beliefs. And he gives an analysis of that difference in terms, in effect, of what we would now call the subjective probabilities uh, associated with the perspective, crucially the perspective of an agent who takes themselves to be able to make certain things true or false. Um, and, and, and he goes on to say that um, in, fr from the situation when we are deliberating seems to me to arise the difference between cause and effect. So another one of the the, the, the the big philosophical problems in this area is about causation. And that seems to be time asymmetric too. We think causes precede their effects. Where does all of that come from? He is Ramsey giving us an answer to that question and putting it all on the psychological side and tying it crucially to this perspective of an agent. Uh, you see how this connects to, to the point you were making. And some, some of that had been done before, but notably by, by David Hume. Because Hume had said that he said there was no real causal necessity in the world. It was just expectation in us formed on the basis of habit. Um, but Hume left out the, um, the, the, the role of the agent. And, and that was the um, new ingredient that, that Ramsey put into the picture. And in my view, it's, it's a completely fundamental contribution. And, uh, uh, and it's one which, who, whose importance has been vindicated in the last 20 or 30 years by a tradition in the study of causation, now often called interventionism, uh, which, which in a sort of mathematical way links the notion of causation to 
to sort of intervening in a system from the outside. I mean, I mean this must be a familiar notion from economists because it's a sort of formalization of thinking that comes naturally to to economists. Uh, I have to when uh, John, when you ask about decision making in terms of as an economist, I immediately have to think about Kahneman uh, on decision making. You know, he's a, Ch a Chicago economist, I think, or psychologist, and he has uh, this uh, work on saying that when we take decisions, we have like a fast brain and a slow brain. And yes. when we are in the fast mode, we take different decisions than if we are in the slow mode. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, uh, the extraordinary fact of Kahneman uh, being uh, appropriated by economists, I think is a demonstration of some of the failure of economics these days in the sense that economists are having to reach outside their subject um, to try to find interesting ideas to uh, replace, oh. for example, the rather discredited um, notions of utility, which have uh, oh. underpinned a lot of economics up until that time, and constrained maximization and so on, as opposed to some form of conception of human behavior. Maybe uh, uh, maybe I, I I'm mis taking this away from maybe I oh. I misunderstood from what you're saying, but taking ideas from outside one's own field isn't a bad thing. <laughs> no, no, I agree. It's a very good thing, but it is interesting uh -huh. that if you look at modern economics, I'm, I'm going on. There's yeah, yeah. lots of this notion of taking things from outside the subject. The, the, of because course, because yeah. of some central. The, center, the core is yeah. unsound. The core is not holding. That's what's happening. Oh, that's what you want to express. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Uh, yeah. You mean the economics needs to be, be put on a stronger foundation, you would say? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the sort of mathematical core, the logical core, mm -hmm. is falling apart, if you like. Really? Oh. Because of that, oh. uh, in, pure, in sort of pure theory, there's this grasping oh. for other uh, other secure grounds from which to oh. bring into economic discussion. So it's I'm, interesting. To, interesting to hear you say that. I mean, from, from the outside, I would have thought the the, the, the problem was more that pe pe people were becoming more and more skeptical about the links between the the, the highly formal theory and, and and the real world. Not that. But it all goes back to Trinity here, it, and, and it's someone who you, as a philosopher, would have come across. It's Pierre Osrafla. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Zrafa's work on economics is still, uh, to use a word that you brought in, a time bomb in the, in the center of theoretical uh, economics. Oh, right. well, that, that's interesting because I didn't know that about, about Zrafa. But what, what I, um, I did know is you, you probably know the, the famous story about Zrafa and, and Wittgenstein. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, I mean, maybe everybody with a Trinity connection knows this, but just in case some of you don't know this, uh, I mean, Straffer was one of the, the few people that Wittgenstein would talk to. Wittgenstein was notoriously uh, antisocial. Um, and and this, if this happened at all, it must have happened around in the, in the sort of late 20s, early 30s, around the, the time when, when Wittgenstein was changing his mind about philosophy, and sort of giving up the, the very logical, analytic, reductive picture that he'd had in the Tractatus and, and moving to something different, a, a, a view involving a much more pluralistic conception of what we do with language. And, and Ramsey was obviously an important influence on that. But the story is that, um, I mean, in the 20s, Wittgenstein was talking about the logical form of statements. Uh, and the story is that Straffer turned to, to Wittgenstein and said, show me the logical form of this, and then made some sort of a Italian obscene gesture, um, which is clearly, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a conventional meaning bearing act in the same way that a speech act is. And yet, equally, obviously, it doesn't have a logical form. So it's a very good point to make. Um, there, there's a, a sort of long, detour I could get into about about Sraffa and, and, and pizza. 
I don't know if we have time for that. Um, it also involves uh, Amartya Sen, who was a student of, of, of Sarafa's. Okay, uh, Gerhard, you're in charge. Can, can, can we go on a little detour? From my point of view, uh, we, the, yeah, I, I, the previous discussions went on for two, two hours and longer. So, but I think mm -hmm. you're, you're, you have further, I think you well, have- Yes, yes, it's, um, um, it, 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 it's past nine here, so I, I don't. I think two hours might be a bit much. I leave let, it to you to uh, tell us when. Let, you... let me tell tell you my little um, uh, my my little um, pizza story. So when I was first in Cambridge um, nine years ago, or so one one of the things I missed coming from Sydney was was good pizza because um, we have wonderful Italian you know, proper uh, uh, Neapolitan pizza in, in Sydney. So at one stage early in the process, before I got busy setting up other things, I, I had this plan of setting up a, a, a pizza restaurant, a very simple model. You, you have to find a, 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 a pizza chef from Naples, but otherwise you, know, you just have a short menu and people don't take long and it's a very good business proposition. It would obviously do well in Cambridge. And uh, I got as far as thinking about what I could call it. I was thinking about, you know, obvious, um, sort of Italian intellectual names like La Sapienza or something like that. But then I thought, Srafa, Srafa, that's the perfect name because he, give it a Trinity connection, um, even a philosophy connection through the story we've just told. Um, and it, it's very nice and, and sort of punchy. So I thought, well, if I do set up my restaurant, I'm going, going to call it Srafa. Uh, and then, uh, you know, sometime after this, a few months later, um, when Cheryl Misak, um, the author of this wonderful new biography of, um, of Ramsey, was a visiting fellow, fellow commoner in, uh, in Trinity, um, we were sitting after lunch downstairs and, and uh, Amartya Sen was there. Um, and Cheryl was talking to Amartya about um, tr trying to do something more with many of Sraffa's papers, uh, which was sort of sitting in the library, but not getting the attention they should have. Um, and so uh, um, Amartya started telling stories about uh, Sraffa and he said, the first thing that Sraffa taught me was how to make a good ristretto. Uh, and so I thought, well, this is my cue. I'll, I'll, I'll tell Amartya about my, 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 my pizza plan. So I, I told him the pizza plan and said I wanted to call um, my pizza restaurant Sraffa. And Amartya said, but Sraffa didn't like pizza. And you, you can imagine how my face fell at that point to be being told by Amartya Sen that well, you know, his teacher didn't like pizza. But then I had a, a, a great thought. I said, do you mean he didn't like Cambridge pizza or he didn't like pizza? Because those were obviously two very different things, especially at the period that we were talking about. But he didn't uh, and Amartya said, I have no evidence for the latter. My evidence for the former is that when we went out for a walk or something and, and decided to have something to eat, Strava would always say no to pizza, but of course he was saying no to, to, to Cambridge pizza in the mid 20th century. So, so at least at least some of my face was saved. And then Amartya said, well, if you do open your restaurant, I'll come and open it for you. <laughs> um, and so that, that was a further incentive, but unfortunately I, I, I got so busy that it never happened. <laughs> I think that's a great story. I'm, I have to go in a moment, but I'll, I'll tell you my philosophical Zrafa story, which also connects in another way to you, Hugh, because it was when there were uh, Trinity in, I think it was 1976 or seven or something like that, put on some Bertrand Russell Memorial Lectures. And the lecturer was Noam Chomsky. And Chomsky was invited both to talk about the theory of language and then also to give a political lecture. It was felt it would cover both aspects of Russell's life. And um, I was the editor of the Cambridge Review at the time, uh, and we persuaded Chomsky to publish the lectures in our magazine. It actually nearly bust the magazine because we usually produced 500 copies and we had to produce 3,500. Um, but there we go. It was a bad business plan. But then I took Chomsky into Trinity for dinner. I was 
told to do this as a young fellow, I think. And the master was Rab Butler. And we sat up next to the master, which I had almost never done as a very young fellow. And uh, opposite us was Zrafa. And um, Rab, as a, as a politician, turned to Chomsky and said, well, Professor Chomsky, uh, could you tell me the foundations of your theory of language? <laughs> and opposite was Srafa, and Srafa was ignoring everybody. As, as he got older, he became more and more insular. And he was there just eating his soup. And Chomsky said, well, language is an unknowable characteristic of the brain. And immediately, Zrafa banged down his spoon and said, then how can you speak of it? And everybody was stunned into silence. And Zrafa went back to eating his soup and ignoring everybody. <laughs> trying to change the conversation. <laughs> So they were, there's a, it was sort of quasi Wittgenstein esque moment. Yes, they, yes. <laughs> yeah, they obviously had they obviously had something in common. Yeah, and then Chomsky said to me, "Who's that?" <laughs> That's wonderful. I said, it's, it's, "It's Rafa," and he said, "Oh my God!" <laughs> so there we are. That was that was my sort of Trinity story connecting <laughs> these things. Hugh, I think, thank you so very much. I think you have told me that you have uh, the next appointment coming up now. Is that right? Um, well, uh, it, it, <coughs> what I actually meant was I, I, I had a series of uh, admissions interviews uh -huh. earlier in the evening. Uh -huh. so, so I've had quite a long evening. Ah, uh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Th these are admission interviews for a new master's course on AI ethics and society uh -huh. that, that our, our center is setting up. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so very much for this fantastic discussion today. Well, this has been great fun. Thank you so much for suggesting it. I'm organizing more. So if you uh, if you are interested, please join again. Uh, I'll... Well, yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd love to do that. And, and if you're holding them um, in the evening Japanese time, and of course, that's a convenient time for me. I, normally, we have it at dinner. You know, normally we meet here in a restaurant and have dinner. But now with the virus situation, uh, yeah. we, I moved it uh, onto Zoom, which is different because we can have people from all over the world now. Yeah. Well, who knows? One of these days, I might be able to come and join you for dinner. Though. When you come to talk, would, please come. We have. We that would be a real, real pleasure. I, let me just mention before we go, since since I've already mentioned pizza. Yes. The last time I was in Tokyo um, was um, in October 2017. Okay, and I had I had a couple of days before the meeting that I was involved in, um, so two evenings sort of on on my own. I thought I, I I know I should I should eat something good, but I thought there's no point in eating Japanese food because you know I I, I have no sense of, of what really good Japanese food is like. But I do know something about pizza, and I know that that you know when Japanese people take something up, they 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 have a tendency to do it extremely well. That's so right. I, uh, Japanese I, I, pizza cooks, they always win the prizes in, in Naples. Yeah, so that's, that's what I did. I, I found these people. And the first night I went to one which turned out to be only 15 minutes walk from my hotel, which was sort of run by the, 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 the young master. And that was that was incredible. But then the, the next night I found you know the one run by his teacher, which was only a little bit further away. Uh, and so I, I, I had some of the best pizza I've ever had in my life in Tokyo, two nights running. You should have told us and we I would have organized a Trinity in Japan event for you. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if I'd only known about you then, but next time. Next time, next time. But thank you so much. And uh, this was fantastic for all of us. Uh, uh, may I say just one word? Oh, yes, of course, of course. Sure. John, eat well, because I was one of the students under his tutorial. And uh, John, uh, very nice to meet you again. Uh, and you had lots of students uh, from America, from Australia, and I met some of them, Peter, Adrian, and all that. We talked about John. Oh, Hitch. yes. Yeah, no, Adrian has been involved in uh, OECD things and so on. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Peter, I, I yeah. worked in the OECD as well. 
Ah, right, okay. So well, I hope, I hope my tutorials didn't do any permanent harm. <laughs> well, I was a bad student, and Peter and Adrian, they were damn good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, great to very see nice, you. Very nice to see you. Great. Thank you very much, Gerhard. Oh, thank you for joining. And uh, we'll be in touch in any case. And when you come to Tokyo, please come and have dinner with us. That'll be great. Both of you. So, excuse us leaving. I have to run away. Very yes. nice to see everybody. Okay. Uh, thank, you to to everyone. Everyone. thank you to everyone. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you. Thank you.